Hello everyone and welcome back to another Lead Green Associate tutorial. Following the Lead rating system for anyone who is looking to get their Lead Green Associate credentials. Today we're going to be talking about sustainable sites. Now the goal here is to reduce the impact of the building site and its maintenance over time to reduce rainwater runoff, the heat island effect, as well as light pollution. And you're going to find that this is applicable to not only new buildings but to existing buildings who are undergoing renovations as well. So let's head to the strategies. If we look at the site, uh, the sustainable sites checklist, we see that there are 10 possible credits, but there's a prerequisite on construction pollution prevention. So what this means is, is remember the prerequisites. This is something that all projects have to follow. So this has to do with minimizing erosion, waterway sedimentation, and airborne dust. And also uh, projects should have uh, erosion and sedimentation plans in place. And this can happen by using either silt fencing and gravel, such as what you see in this picture below, and also filtration materials or wetting the dirt so that there's not so much airborne dust. And also they want to reduce the impact on bulldozed land and, and using as, as little open space as possible. This is why it's important to develop on existing sites, which we'll see here. Uh, a, a project should dedicate areas as protected habitats and open spaces. This pretty much means, hey, these areas are not going to be touched. They could be for recreational use or just for protecting uh, the habitats, and it should take up about 30% or greater uh, than the building area. They want to build on previously developed land. Uh, if you think about all of these abandoned buildings and, and sites that are not in use anymore, uh, it really can be a waste. So. What LEED is trying to do is redevelop these areas into areas that are usable, and you can even use brownfields, these contaminated sites that, that have a history of contamination. A LEED project could come in and help to remediate these areas. So reusing previously developed land and remediation are two really important concepts here. Now there's also reducing the building footprint. The building footprint is the perimeter of the building on the land uh, that it meets, basically the outline of the building and where it meets the land. So we want to reduce that building footprint, which in turn reduces materials, reduces construction impacts, and also energy use later on for HVAC systems and energy use. A key concept here is to build vertically, not horizontally. Building horizontally contributes to the building footprint, which is not something you want to do or even have to do. So build up rather than out, have underground parking. Underground parking is going to come back in a bunch of lead categories uh, later on. So that's really important. Increase the site density. Uh, site density doesn't mean that everyone's all close together and it's a really crowded office space, but make the best use of the space because a high density and a small footprint is going to have the least impact. Now we also want to have adaptive and native species planted in the landscaping because adaptive and native species use little to no water, little to no pesticides. It's really great for water management, reducing impact, and, uh, you know, these plants already know the drought cycles. They're adjusted to that. They're adjusted to the climate. They don't need a whole lot to be taken care of. Finally, you want to have a site management plan for all chemical uses, whether it's cleaning the building interior or exterior, um, something as simple as, as the cleaning materials in the janitor's closet. So next on to rainwater management. There's a term called hardscapes, which luckily a hardscape is exactly what it says it is. It's a hard landscape. It could be something like asphalt or concrete, which you see in parking lots or roofs. These are two great examples of hardscapes. Now, minimizing hardscapes is important to minimize runoff and the heat island effect. If you see in this picture below, uh, this, this flooding here, this, this runoff can carry harmful uh, pollutants and chemicals uh, into the water system. And also, it, it's putting water in areas it's not supposed to. So hardscapes contribute to that, and we don't want to do that. So we want to duplicate the natural hydrology of the area. We could do this by two popular options, installing vegetative roofing and rain gardens. Rain gardens are fantastic. They could be on the roof or, or on the ground below. And uh, what, what the goal here is, is to minimize pollution, to minimize runoff, uh, while also trying to restore the natural hydrology. And uh, rainwater can also be collected. It could be collected for flush outlets, such as toilets, or just used in irrigation. Um, and it could be active or, or passive. An active system would be collecting rainwater and uh, saving it up for when you need it and where you need it. So on to the heat island effect. This is something that we're talking about temperature. 
Uh, heat island effect is an increase in microclimate temperature, either from human activity, building operations, or especially surfaces like those hardscapes we just talked about. If you look at this picture below, you can see that the urban areas have the highest temperature, thanks to the hardscapes and surfaces, uh, uh, mostly the dark surfaces, which absorb heat. You can see as we go to the suburbs, to the right, and the rural areas, we just see a reduction in, a, in a, the temperature, thanks to the more vegetative cover. So this puts a really big strain on HVAC systems here in the urban areas. Um, if, if you have dark hardscapes, it heats up the building site and you really don't have to do that. So reducing dark hardscapes has a great effect on uh, reducing energy loads. Uh, so if you do have hardscapes, then the goal would be to provide shade and vegetation and also underground parking because this is reducing the exposed hardscapes. Uh, underground parking is, like I said, is going to come back. It's a really big key concept here. And also using reflective materials with a high SRI, such as white roofing, to reflect some of that energy back to where it should be. So finally, light pollution. Light pollution doesn't seem like it's that big of a problem, but it actually uh, can be. It really has an effect on humans and uh, our sleep cycles, our circadian rhythms, as well as animal circadian rhythms and nocturnal species as well. So to minimize light pollution, we first want to minimize artificial lighting. We want to design the building and the site to collect as much natural daylight as possible. So think about building a, a, a building that's more curved and circular rather than square because it collects daylight better across the entire building site. The design of the windows, the design of window sills, the paint that you use inside, this all has uh, a profound effect on uh, daylighting. Now there are three pollution types which are uplighting, glare, and trespass. Trespass is basically light going where it's not supposed to. Glare we're all familiar with if we've ever ridden in a car. And uplighting is what you see in this picture uh, on the right of the strip where it says no cutoff angle. That street light is not a good design at all because light is going every which way and we don't want that. We, light, we want the light going where it's supposed to, such as this picture to the left. Uh, this square design, this is known as a full cutoff design and the light is going straight to the ground or a little bit off to the side. And this is a design that we want to see. Uh, the light is only w going where it's supposed to. So installing motion sensors and timers into rooms for internal light use is also very important because it's something that some people don't think about. They go into a room for a really short amount of time and they forget to turn the light off for whatever reason. It could stay on all day and all night. So having a combination of motion sensors and timers is really important. Finally, eliminate unnecessary lights. I work in a place that, that has this one hallway with really bright lights and we don't even turn the lights on uh, because it's just so blindingly bright and there's, there's no point to having that. So uh, a really good a uh, common concept in lead is to reduce demand from the start. So either to, by turning lights off or by, uh, ha by smart lighting, by putting lights where they're supposed to and not more than, than needed. So that's it for the sustainable sites category. We're going to see a lot of these concepts later on in the uh, location and transportation uh, in um, energy and atmosphere. So uh, this is a really core concept chapter that you really should know for the exam. Um, so good luck with that. Keep refreshing yourself on the material, memorize the checklist, and we'll see you later. Thanks for watching.